All right, ClubWWY.com members. I'm standing by this week with a gentleman who is not only a Hall of Famer, but a true legend in this business. And if you've heard any of my audios, you know that I think he's probably, uh, if not one of the, the best heels uh, in the history of professional wrestling. Uh, one of the baddest, baddest guys, one of the goodest, goodest guys when he was good. But above all else, he's always been magnificent. The one and only, Mr. Don Morocco. Don, how are you? Hey, what an introduction. <laughs> you what? Oh, good. You deserve it, man. Before anything, Don, let's just get into uh, how things are by you. What's going on in the world of Don Morocco? Oh, great. I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm sitting overlooking uh, on a little bay. I don't know ever. Oh, man. I love to know. It's even worse. So. Some beautiful. Know? Some beautiful about living in paradise, right? Something, <laughs> you wake up every day in paradise. Yeah, I can't complain. Well, you've done you've done a lot of work in Hawaii. You were actually uh, I, I, before you became a professional wrestler, you were actually a, a state wrestling uh, champion in Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah, I did the amateur thing for a couple of years, uh, high school, and then um, played ball and mostly surfed, a lot of surfing. That's one of those things too. It kind of carried over. I remember, uh, especially early on when I was watching you uh, in the WWF days. Uh, it was one of those gimmicks that and I, I had interviewed Mr. Fuji, and we had talked a lot about Fuji Vice and, and some of the, the ways that you guys were able to kind of work the whole Hawaii, uh, you know, type of uh, aura in, in, into your whole gimmick. Yeah, I guess, you know, kind of once you come from here, you, you know, you can take the boy out of the islands, not the islands, not the boy, maybe, I guess, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a growing experience living here, growing up here, real fortunate. You had, you had a hand too recently. I know in uh, in Hawaii Championship Wrestling, you were involved in for a few years too, right? Um, a little bit, yeah. I was that was uh, I did some motive. I was trying to get my keep my son, uh, my foot in the ring, kind of so to speak, out in the ring, trying to keep my son busy. But that that didn't really turn out. So. Would you? But yeah, I was uh, in, intermittently in there. Do you still watch today? Do you get the chance to watch WWE or, or TNA at all? From time to time, yeah. Yeah, I catch up. I was surprised uh, to catch TNA a month or so ago that then when everybody just went over there all of a sudden, from all, all a bunch of hunks guys came came with them. Oh yeah. Was, uh, to keep Rick, see Rick Flair keep going, it's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy, right? It's like he's like the, the Energizer Bunny of wrestling. Inspirational, I know. Yeah. I think I trained him. I mean, I was even younger than he was when I was training him, and then. Uh, to see him still going, it, you know, it's just remarkable. It's insane. Well, one of the things, too, I know that, you know, I talk, I talk about today's wrestling and how things have kind of changed, and, and one of the things that I know you used to do, and, and one of my, my favorite things to do now is to go on YouTube and watch uh, a lot of the stuff that you did with, with Piper or just a lot of the interviews that you used to do. And one of the things that you did that not a lot of guys get to do today made a lot of ad-libbing. A, a lot of the promos that people still remember to this day were, were things that you just kind of came up with yourself. Is that right? Yeah, well, uh, Pretty much 100%, I guess, you know, that, that was, uh, we, well, we did all our own stuff back then, you know, so it was just, I, I guess, keeping current, you know, yeah. keeping on top of current events, whatever you happen to be your thing, or, you know, and, and then selling the things that you were doing, like surfing or, or bagpipes, like Piper, or, or different things like that, but yeah, it was almost all right, I guess. About 100%. I thought it was it was so funny because, you know, things have changed and everybody's kind of politically correct nowadays that I was watching, I, I think you were being interviewed by Buddy Rogers, and, and what I loved about the interview, you were talking about Tito Santana, and all of a sudden he got to him and he called him a wetback, and the way he said it, he almost like spit it out in a way, and it was, there was just something so real about it, you know what I mean? Like, it didn't seem like, you know, a lot of times people today are kind of used to a, a different form of wrestling, but back when, when I remember watching Don Morocco, it, it just felt real to see it. Yeah, I guess you could, you know, the, the, you, when you see things you, you can get away, get away with now. I spoke with Howard Finkel uh, several weeks ago when uh, the, the Tiger Woods thing was going down. Mm -hmm. I said, boy, Vince really missed the boat on that. I said, he should have been running around. And that's just, that's what millionaires, that's the way billionaires live. You know, that's what happens. <laughs> Again, then Howard said, well, he didn't want to muddy the waters for the, senatorial race that the wife was in, so he didn't push it too far. But that, that would have been my call if I was Vince there. It, was, it would have been funny. I think it would have been apropos. <laughs> it's so funny because you say that, and now there's all these rumors that just started about a couple of days ago that they want to try to get Tiger Woods to come and, and be a guest on, on Monday Night Raw with everything going on, but he's actually considering it. Well, I 
would, you know, why not? It's, uh... Pretty much. Yeah, I don't, I don't you know, his image and, 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 you know, whatever, you know, to be involved with professional wrestling, everybody, I want Ben Roethlisberger was there, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you see, we have, uh, we have Tiger Jeet Singh, we have Tiger Ali Singh, we got Tiger Woods, and it all, <laughs> all kind of works out in the end. But, no cage with Tigers. Yeah, right. Let me ask you a little bit about about your time in WWF because you know, obviously, I mean, you've had such a long career, and I, I know I'm kind of jumping to the parts that that I remember the most because I, I, I mean, I'm from New York, so I grew up watching WWF, and I think one of the things that I that I love the most was around 1987 when you were involved in the feud with uh, with Roddy Piper. Uh, it was you and Orton and Adrian Adonis uh, and Roddy, and and to this day, it's it's probably one of my favorite feuds ever because. The way it actually came about, you weren't even supposed to be a part of it. You came out as a guest on Piper's Pit and got involved. And I mean, you talk about a bunch of people to work together. You, Adrian, and Roddy, and, and Jimmy Hart, and, and Bob Orton, just, you know, all these different personalities came together uh, and really got that over as one of the best uh, angles they had for a while, especially with Piper turning turning babyface and, and kind of having to have him be the good guy. I mean, you talk about, you know, the best guys to put him up against. You and Adrian were, were two of the, the baddest that they had on the roster. Well, oddly enough, you know, we were close to friends, too. Mm-hmm. You know, Adrian and myself, uh, Keith Franks, go way back to Tampa, and, and Piper and myself went way back to, uh, way, way back to uh, L.A., uh, Olympic Auditorium, mm-hmm. when he was working for Mike LaBelle and stuff, and and, and with Chavo Guerrero in, in those days. And I don't know if people remember that, but to, you know, how, how far and how long, you know, together we've been, you know, we've been Bob Horton. Too in Georgia and and and, and, and Tampa and those areas too. So you know, there's a there's a group of guys that have been together, and known each other, and respected each other, and had fun with each other for for quite some time. I mean, Piper was doing it. I was talking about YouTube before. I'd watched um, him and beating up Vicky Williams, which was you know decades almost before its time of, of some of the angles they did. I mean, you guys were doing stuff years before anybody ever dreamt of doing it on a national stage. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I, we weren't that happened, but the, you, we were lucky to be on, on that that particular uh, stage. Because uh, I remember when I was a kid growing up, Ed Francis and had some Johnny Baran and those guys, courtesy Al Kia. They were doing some wild stuff, you know, that you know that was comparable to the stuff that Vince was doing in his day. So I, I, they're, they're you know they're in the pockets pockets of wrestling. All over the all over the country, they were doing some pretty way out stuff. You know, and it, it was a way out business. I guess it still is pretty good. Yeah, we kind of felt that way too. I mean, obviously, you know, I said before about YouTube and a lot of people rediscovering wrestling, but you know, people talk about Vince McMahon kind of expanding the business, and it, sometimes it feels like. You know, if, if it wasn't Vince, somebody would have done it by now. It was kind of just a natural next step for for almost that that huge explosion of going national like that. I, I suppose so. You know, Barnett was Barnett was in there trying to do it. There, there are a lot of guys trying to do it, but um, you know, he went out on the limb and, t- and took a big chance back in those USA Network days and stuff like that. And luckily, he had a uh, he had a crew good enough. And I, I think the competition from uh, from Atlanta probably helped a lot too. Mm-hmm. We had you know good great competition with uh, Flair and the Road Warriors and. A lot of those guys, they were over there at the time, too. So, you know, competition, it was a healthy, healthy thing. Well, Don, even long before that, some of the things that you were involved in were, were pretty big, too. For example, um, you know, obviously Jack Briscoe just passed away recently, but you had a, I mean, early on in your career, that was a, one of the biggest moments that you had it was, uh, was the work that you did with Jack. Yeah, right. The Jack Briscoe and Andre the Giant and um, Ivan Koloff mm-hmm. had a lot of stuff uh you know, different, you know, great, great opportunity, a lot of guys like that. But I was, yeah, I, I, I just, uh, Jack and Jerry, and I spent a lot of time with those guys in Florida. I mean, your style, too. I mean, that's something else that I think a lot of fans have noticed. You had you had a unique style in that. I mean, you were a power wrestler, but at the same time, I mean, you wrestled. And I think a lot of times today, fans, they, they kind of tend to put those guys in either one or two categories. Either you're a big powerhouse or you're a technical wrestler. But, I mean, out of everybody I remember, I think you were one of the best at, at kind of putting those two styles together. Well, I guess, you know, whatever, whatever good. <laughs> A little different. I mean, back then it kind of seemed like you guys had a lot more leeway in terms of what you did in the ring. So, I mean, a lot of times you kind of cultivated your style over time, you know, while you were in the ring. Yeah, well, early early on 
and then my career, you were able to, you were, you were working with different guys every night, you know. Mm. And it was a, kind of a different atmosphere, and you, you know, it was a, almost every, it was always a, more or less a learning procedure. Because you, 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 you kick chain as opposed to WWF where you wrestle the same guy over and over again after a while. You know, so yeah, you're, you had the opportunity to change and get, get uh, exposed to a lot of different guys. Exactly. I mean, and the whole business itself is different. I've talked to a lot of people who broke in around, around the same time that you did, and I always kind of point out that nowadays, if, if you want to become a wrestler, you go into Google, you search for wrestling school, you, you don't even know what you end up with, you end up somewhere. But, I mean, to break in when you broke in, I mean, the business was, was a pretty guarded place, and, and kind of breaking in back then it isn't what a lot of people know it to be now. Yeah, well, like uh, courtesy or KSC, you know, it was special. And those days you had to be invited into the uh, into the circle. You know, you just didn't uh, enroll in a school or, or, you know, or take lessons or or do whatever they did. Now, you pretty much had to be invited in. So, yeah, you were, you know, you were pretty lucky to be uh, to be included. Yeah, it was, almost, it was almost like an honor. I touched a lot of those guys, too, back then. They tried to weed you out. I mean, it was... It's kind of a tough man's business too. You couldn't. You had to be tough to to stay uh, after the first week. Well, everybody had that, um, you know, that amateur wrestling submission wrestling background. Not everybody, but you know, if there wasn't that, then they were pro ball players or something else. And everybody kind of have a, had a, had a, some type of background, which is you know, led to egos and everything else. Well, yeah. Well, one of the other things, too, I'm sure this is one of the questions that you're asked almost every time you meet a fan is obviously about Jimmy Snuka, which was one of, you know, his, probably his most memorable moment for fans of his career, and, and you were right there taking it, that big superfly leap off the top of the cage. And, and you know, for you, what was that like? And, and kind of, uh, was there any, you know, worry beforehand? I mean, obviously, you know, the, the margin of error is kind of small when somebody's leaping from that kind of kind of height on top of you. I mean, what, what was that kind of setup for you, and, and, and how did you feel, uh, you know, just taking that move and, and looking back on it? Um, pretty much, yeah, uh, that's what we'd work for, you know. That's that's what we'd spend all those months trying to create, and that was like the crescendo of the moment that, that uh, you know, that we knew it was right, and uh, we stuck the Rocky Johnson and myself in there for three or four months before the thing, and let that thing fester a little bit more. And then by the time you know we did blow that off, uh, you know I, I had no. Well, that was kind of you know I didn't really I wasn't afraid of getting hurt or anything. I, I had a lot of confidence in Snooker, yeah. and I did uh, I did catch a knee in the leg, you know. No, that's that's the side though. It's just a, you know part of the part of the game. Did you know, like when when you're laying there on the mat and he hits you with a move like that? Did you know in your head as you got hit, like this is going to be a highlight reel forever? I mean, it was it's one of those things that when you saw it happen, you knew it. But I mean, just taking the move, like when, when he hit you, just in your head, just go, "Good, we got it." Yeah, well, you know, it, it seems like it, for its in it, it, its. Uh, and it's our own identity. We thought, you know, as far as I was concerned, that, that it would be, you know, it would mean not, not, not necessarily that it would go to the levels that it's reached, you know, that they've been since used it for years, and a lot of other people use it as, like, at the start of, uh, you know, the, the, you know, extreme wrestling and stuff like that. But, you know, we never really experienced it quite with that. But, you know, it was kind of what we hoped we get. The jets are flying over now, so I have to turn. No worries. I really don't have to put my window up. I mean, that was, I mean, even to this day, and that was one of the things that Mick Foley has always talked about, kind of inspired him, you know, just the fact that even just a spot like that, the fact that it, it reached so many people, and, and to this day it's kind of one of those things that's still brought up as an inspiration for, for people who are in the business now. Because the business kind of kind of skewed towards that a little bit, where it became more about some of the, the spectacular moves and the, the amazing stuff, and, and so many people point to that as, as kind of the, you know, when it all kind of began for a lot of people, when they started realizing the extent of what they can really do in, in, in the wrestling business. Yeah, they're really, these guys are really going for it now. I see some of the stuff they do, it's, it's wild. Yeah. So, uh, you know, pretty part of it was, you know, I was, I was lucky I was before that Andre the Giant told me from the, from the, from the floor back over to the top rope on Dolly Anderson. <laughs> that was just, that was a uh, back in back in the old Tampa wrestling. So that was uh, that's pretty exciting. You know, that was good. pretty exciting to be part of that too. 
Andre, Andre was, uh, I mean, I've heard some amazing stories about Andre the Giant. Just, uh, he's one of those guys that you hear all the stories and you, he kind of, he's a legend, but, but he really was a legend. A lot of the things that he did are just mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And you know, basically, so, so, you know, real, real intelligent guy. You know, he, he uh, obviously he's just a giant, so we thought, you know, he's a step short. But he, you know, he was quick thinking, good card player, you know, a wise businessman. He's a general, generally a good guy for, for most of us, you know. I, I was around him a lot. I, 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 was, uh, I, I was his tag team partner for a lot of places they'd fly me in. Like, you know, the weak link for the giant and stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Going into the baby face high spots and stuff and then sell and give him the big tag and go home. So, I spent a lot of time with him and he was, uh, he, early on in the business he was a real happy guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, great to be around. He grew bitter towards the end. I guess he, really, he had a lot of pain. He got tired of being a giant and being the center, you know. It was kind of a lonely existence, but, but he was always, Always a great guy to me. Well, one of the things that would sound sad, I think somebody had, had told me, somebody had traveled with my favorite wrestler, that one of the things with him was that, you know, obviously with wrestling, travel is a big part of it. And here's this guy who's just, I mean, he's such a spectacle. And one of the hardest things for a big guy to do is do some of the traveling. You know, to travel anywhere, even to go on a trip. And, and this is something he was doing all the time. So it was, he couldn't just sit in an airport and just be kind of left alone. He always had people kind of running over to him. Yeah, but I used to see him walk through the crowds of Japan. Mm-hmm. Swat thousands of dollars worth of cameras around at one time. And you know, the Japanese were all, you know, it was different. You know, different places. After a time, you know, the crowd was, he was, was on the giant. You couldn't miss him. Yeah, exactly. Anywhere you, know, you went, you know, he caught your eye. He couldn't help it. And to this day, they even have, I've noticed that, that these little stickers have popped up with his face on them. And you've ever seen these, these Andre the Giant faces obey on them and stuff. It's almost like become almost, uh, like kind of like a graffiti thing, you know, where, where his, Everyone knows Andre the Giant, even outside of wrestling. So even, you know, anybody who's out there who's ever followed pop culture, he's become like, you know, Mr. T and, and the Gremlins, and, and everybody knows Andre. Yeah, well, um, you know, the McMahons loved him, too, you know. So the Vince Sr. And, and and followed by Vince Jr., you know, they they, uh, they kept him, they kept him in, in highest esteem. Oh, absolutely. And, and he probably, you know, where he should have been, you know. Where he, where he belonged to me, but, but the, the McMahons uh, always looked up to him as far as, you know, a car to draw. Just a kind of person, too. But someone touched I don't the, the I was going to say, I touched upon something before that I wanted to ask you about uh, when I interviewed Mr. Fuji. Uh, obviously, Fuji Vice, where that you work with Mr. Fuji, and, and just TNT in general, the show that WWF had done, which seemed almost tailor made for you. Like I said before, I watched a lot of your promos before, you know, the, the rock and wrestling days, and it almost seemed like you were made for kind of the, the generation that a lot of people remembered you from, the, the mid-'80s with, with WWF, uh, going through some of that and getting a chance to, to do something, you know, I mean, there, there was wrestling promos, and then there were the Fuji Vice skits were, were kind of unlike anything that had really happened in wrestling, the whole show itself. Uh, how was TNT for you, and were you excited about it at the time, and, and did, you, did you realize that they would be, uh, you know, again, I'll say as memorable uh, today as they were then? Oh, uh, no, no, you, you know, we were so busy at the time. It'd be hard to single out, you know, really, you know, say, oh, this is, you know, uh, you need piece to piece of your wrestling history, because that was usually on a Saturday morning in between uh, whatever was Friday night and whatever was going to be Saturday night. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, you're in, you're in the middle of uh, of an action there. You show up at that Baltimore studio and then and and and, uh, and do the filming and stuff, all that stuff. And you know, some of that stuff was pretty wild. The worst, uh, the worse you did, the better they liked it. You know. <laughs> Where's the acting? I, I, I'll never forget the, um, the Johnny Carson monologue they gave me where they ran the, they ran the tele, teleprompter so fast, I could, you know, it was like a speed reading course. I, I mean, to this day, I don't remember. I remember Emil the Marcos and something about shoes, but I don't remember <laughs> I don't, I don't remember anything about it. It was just, it just, you know, I was just reading this teleprompter was going so fast and, you know, they had the drum sounds in the back and stuff for all the lousy jokes. But that was, uh, I guess the, the the better the better. I mean, the worse, the better, you know, better the better. I I, as as ever, I just saw that. I think yesterday. Honestly, I think it was you and Fuji. You guys were sitting there and you, you were doing kind of. He was just like laughing like Ed McMahon, and you were and you were doing the jokes. But it was I was noticing that you were talking faster as it kept going. Oh yeah, that thing was just burning. I mean, it just, 
you know, there are, you, you get Vince, you know, I'm sure Vince is in bad prodding him <laughs> to do that, to run that thing as fast as possible. So. It's funny that you bring that it, and it's funny that you bring up the travel because I, I just seen a, an interview, I think, with the Ultimate Warrior talking about not really, you know, people say, you know, would you remember this pay-per-view and do you remember that? And he had said, you know, what, we'd be on the road five days a week that, you know, we didn't really think this is a pay-per-view, this is that, because, you know, it was just another night a different town and you had to go somewhere else. It's, it's almost like sometimes with a wrestling career, it's the kind of career where, where you participate in it, but you don't really get a chance to, to see or experience a lot of it until, you know, you get a chance to either take some time off or sit back at the end because, I mean, you're constantly on the go. Yeah, fifty fifty, you know, like sometime I remember Dusty was in there for a weekend one time and like we're uh, I guess with the spectrum and you know, we're up in Hartford and that, that's a twenty thousand you know, I mean we're doing great business in those days. I mean, it was not yeah. unique to the day, but you know, we're doing twenty twenty one thousand, whatever the building would hold, we were selling out and I was saying, where are we tomorrow, you know? And um, uh, Madison Square Garden, hello, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, oh well, you know, fine. You know, this was like a Saturday, Sunday, Monday deal. We're running through, and, the, and the, each building had, you know, in excess of 20,000 people. So we're going, you know, and, just, and we'd been running all, you know, all week or however long we, he, he kept us running for yeah. at the time. You know, I just, hey, well, you know, and Dusty come in like he was coming in out of, you know, Florida or Georgia, wherever he happened to be at the time, and, you know, he kind of did grasp that, you know, they were, we're in the garden tomorrow, bro, you know, hello. You know, it, was, it, it didn't seem at the time, you know, it was, it was a little, it was a little underwhelming. Well, they drove to a lot of places in W. WCW was more, it kind of seemed like localized. I mean, once in a while they fly here or there, but for the most part, a lot of their stuff kind of took place in, in the same general area so they were able to drive. I mean, you guys in, in WWF, you were all over the place. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and that, that organization he put together really got, uh, you know, it was, it just turned into an international thing. Oh, yeah. I just read yesterday of other guys are having problems getting around because of the volcano in Iceland or something. Oh, yeah. Traveling by boat and ferry and plane and car to get to the next town or something. So, welcome to our world, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you about WCW because, I mean, you... To the best of my mind, I know you went, you, you wrestled in some of the territories that were associated, but you were never in WCW, is that right? Not, not even, uh... NWA. I was yeah. in the, the NWA. But not after Turner bought it, though. Oh, no. Was there any thought about? I kind of, I kind of got out of business after 88. I, I was still connected, you know, overseas. And, mm-hmm. and doing stuff in, in individual promotions, but... I don't, I didn't enter, I went to ECW. Yeah. For a little while, because of Bob Ortiz, and that was just a starting up thing anyway at the time. But aside from that, I get, I, I pretty much got out of the business. That was huge. Well, even ECW with you, I mean, that was, I mean, you know, it went on to so many different things that I ended up doing, but I mean, you, I think early on, it was you, Snuka, uh, Salvatore, Baloma were kind of the guys who, you know, for a company that didn't really have anybody, I mean, you guys are the big name stars, and, and I think a lot of people, even to this day, when they really do their research on ECW, you know, it was, it was you and Jimmy that, that really kind of put that place on the map to begin with. Well, I don't know about that, but no? possibly, I, I don't really... They have much, you know, no, have a great, real big knowledge of ECW. Mm. I know a lot of those guys over there worked real hard. Jack to Jack and Terry Fonks and, you know, a lot of those, Tommy Dreamer and, you know, all the, what, uh, what's his name? Sandman and all them. Sandman, yeah. Oh, yeah. And all those guys, they, 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 they paid a heavy dues in that ECW in the beginning, so. Yeah. You know, maybe it was our, you know, they had, you know, uh, our, our names gave them a big, you know, a big hand. Especially early on. For helping, but, uh, I know a lot of those guys did a lot of way out stuff. Sabu. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Some of the stuff he did. Yeah, Sabu. Terry Funk. Of course, Terry Funk was all over the place. I don't know. Is he still going? <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> I, think, I think he might be. I can I can't even give you an answer because it'll be outdated by the time I finish answering you. I'll say, no, he's not, and he'll be back in the ring. Yeah, that's true. Well, you, you talked about your name. I want to ask you about one of the names that you use because to this day, I'm, I, you know, you still hear people say, you know, the original Rock, Dom Rocco. And it's got to be crazy for you the fact that, you know, Rocky Maivia 
you know, it became The Rock and kind of went on to so many things. But in WWF, I mean, for for a while, for a lot of fans, you was Don The Rock Morocco. I mean, did that still come up sometimes that, uh, you know, the, the 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 original Rock or one of the real Rocks? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Surprisingly enough, because the, the, the majority of my career was in Magnificent Morocco, you know. Mm-hmm. And what I consider my, my most successful, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my best years there, the most enjoyable years I had as a heel and stuff. Really nice to have some but you know, it, 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 it's always nice that you never know if a payday ever turns up every now and then. Being the Rock, or you know, the original Rock, and, and then people go through that, and you know, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't really hurt to be associated with Dewey Johnson. No, not at all. He was, he was, a, he was a little spoiled brat for his grandmother. Yeah, <laughs> uh, over here on uh, on Real Avenue. <laughs> oh man. Well, I mean, this is going to be crazy for you, too, to get to see a lot of these kids grow up, because, I mean, being a part yeah, of that company. Yeah, Bob Orton's Randy Orton. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Orton and, uh, and, and, you know, Dwayne Johnson and uh, Davey Boyce, all these guys, yeah. It is. It, you know, it's, it's a thrill. It, it is. is it's, you know, it's just like nice, great to see. No, absolutely. One of the last things I want to ask you is about, obviously, the Hall of Fame. Because that was, uh, you know, in my opinion, I said this before, and you, you might think that I'm just saying this to have you on, but I, I have proof backing it up. I've done audios. Uh, I mean, you're a Hall of Famer, but I really think that in the grand scheme of things, you're, you're, you're truly one of the best in the business. You've done so many great things. Uh, and it's one of those deals that as wrestling changes and continues to change, I think a lot of people go back and they get to watch a lot of the stuff you did and realize just how, you know, how things have changed and how people like, you know, that were able to do some of the things you were able to do don't, don't really exist in the business anymore. Uh, but aside from that, it must have felt good to be honored with the Hall of Fame. It's kind of, in a way, almost being honored by your peers. What was it like for you being asked to be there and, and actually being inducted into WWE's Hall of Fame? I was, uh, I, like you said, I was honored. I, you know, it is what it is. You know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's just turned into a show and, and, uh, and a lot of things. But still, I, you know, I still, I still see it as, as uh, you know, recognition by your, by my peers and, and by other guys. I was, I was stoked to be in it. I was stoked to be a part of it. I've heard other guys, you know, just call it a this and that and, you know, and, and kind of kind of degrade it. But, uh, you know, the McMahon's take you in there wherever it happened to be. For me, it happened to be uh, in, in New York, which was a great time. They flew me and my family in and uh, first class, and we got treated first class. And, and, you know, and everything, you know, everything. It was a great, great four or five days. We went to WrestleMania, and that's always, that's always a fantastic show that Vince puts on. So, you know, I would, you know, it was, it was special for me. And they sent me a nice, nice, uh, nice ring, the Hall of Fame ring and the old four. And, you know, I it was, it was stoking. I know, you know, like I said, it is what it is. You know, you, you, you can take from it or put that to it or make it what it was. But, but for me, it was an honor and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm proud to be in it. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that I get from even just talking to you is that sometimes you you talk to people who sometimes they expect you know Vince is going to bring them back every day, and then you have some people who just become bitter to the business. It sounds like I mean you, you kind of put everything in perspective. You, you've stayed grounded through all the years. Oh, uh, I was lucky, you know. I came back home. I got a. I was able to take a job. A lot of guys aren't you know can't uh, can't lower their, their, their themselves to, to to work. You know, I got a. I, I was a good hard labor job. I was a, I was a longshoreman okay. for 14, 15 years, and then you know I progressed. I have become a, a, a wharf clerk now. Not the docks. It doesn't involve any labor or anything else. But I enjoyed the hard labor. I, was, I turned 40 years old. I had to get a real job after all those years. Yeah. So you know, but I have to, you know I I can't have no. I, if I do, you know, I have to sit down and think about it. If I have any regrets, I'd have to list them down and. and Think deeply, but uh, you know, as things went by, you know, they went by, and it was it was a great career, good time, a lot of friends, a lot of great people I knew, great people I met, you know, uh, great great experiences we went through, you know, traveling around the world, with guys like the Sheik and Mr. Fuji and Roddy Piper. I mean, you know, those guys are all characters by themselves, much less you know, you, you can put a couple other retards together. And it's, 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 it's a, it's a real great idea sometimes. <laughs> the Iron Sheik, I think his uh, his career has taken the, the weirdest turn. I think I just you know on Howard Stern and, and and everything he's done, he's kind of found this new life of just being uh, the Iron Sheik with the volume turned up to about twenty. 
Oh, yeah. He, 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 he was, uh, I remember him, Cosper Missouri, when he broke in with Ric Flair, that same, uh, that same group out of Ben Bergani's, Bergani's barn, working out with him and Flair and... Ken Patera was in there, right? I'm sorry? Ken Patera was in there too, right? Ken Patera, Jimmy uh, Bruggers, his old football player, Greg Gagne, Jim Brunzel, the Sheik, Patera, yeah. All those guys, six of them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there was a, out at uh, Vern Gagne's, uh, they had a ranch outside Minneapolis. And, yeah. um, Joe Scarpello and Robinson, and Vern, all those guys wanted to do was learn how to work, and they would go down and stretch the hell out of them. They could probably all beat the shit out of me, so I just, uh, I'd go down and I taught them how to work, so they, they couldn't wait till I showed up, you know. <laughs> so, I was doing taking arm drags and tackles and slams and all the other stuff. <laughs> all the other guys got them on the mat, cross face, and you know, the, all, the, <laughs> all the MMA stuff of today. The, the sprawls and the, the jokes and everything else. So they're, they're, happy, they're always happy to see me show up. Oh, man. They're probably all sore, and, and they untie the knots in their arms, and then they can go and uh, do some body slam. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it was a rugged group anyway. You know, it's, it's, uh, the Sheik was, you know, a, a submission wrestler from Iraq, Iran. So, mm-hmm. You know, they, they weren't, and Yan Ken Patera was the world's strongest man. But, you know, of course, he didn't know the wrestling. And the other guys have been around, but, you know, they... You know, like they do now, they tar you out, and then they kick you wing in, and they make you fight and stuff like that. But, you know, it was, it, was, it was a trip with those guys. Absolutely. Well, Don, before I let you go, uh, one of the last questions I'm going to ask you, we ask all of our guests the same question. Uh, if you could choose someone, maybe someone that you grew up watching, maybe somebody from today that you were never in the ring with, that you say, you know what, I, I wish Don Morocco could have worked with this person. Who would you pick? Oh, boy. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I always get that from people. Somebody maybe that you watched as, when you were a kid or, you know, somebody's kid today. I worked with everybody, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm going to go with one guy, uh, Kurt Engel, I like. Okay. Like Kurt Engel, Kurt Engel looks, uh, I, I like, you know, there's not two guys, Undertaker. Undertaker looks like he, you know, he, he, you know, he, I've seen him in, in some big matches really, really turn it up and really get going. But uh, Kurt Engel's one of the guys that I would say. About old guys, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I wrestle, I, mean, I work with most of the old guys. I mean, some of the Hans Schmitz and those guys are even still around when I was breaking into Minneapolis. So. True. Like Anya, <laughs> Man, yeah, I, I never wrestled there, so I, I can go that far. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He was wrestling up until, like, uh, I remember there was one match he had when, like, 86 or something like that. It was uh, He was wrestling yeah, yeah. until uh, the very end. I never, I never had the pleasure. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of guys I had the pleasure of, you know. The Fox, Story Jr., you know, even and Ray Stevens. Those are, those, Story Jr. And, and Ray were probably the, like, two, two all-time favorites. And, uh, oh, okay, if you go this way, uh, Story Fox Sr. Okay. How's that one? Cause I heard so much about him. And I heard that, yeah, it would be, I guess, be Kurt, for modern day, be Kurt Engel, old day, uh, Dory Funk Sr. Awesome. Yeah, that, that, that'd be, I think that would be two guys that, uh, two guys that missed the boat with. Excellent. Don, before I let you go, we give all of our guests a chance to talk to their fans. So, what do you have to say to all the Don Morocco fans out there who, uh, have been following you since day one? No, oh, thanks, thanks. I still get to, I try and, I, Somebody posted my address on uh, on the internet or something, and I try and try and get to everybody. I, I try to send back as many the, the autograph cards and the and the pictures and stuff to come by. But thanks for your support for all these years, and, and you know, thanks for the memories. It's good. It was a, it was a, it's a great life. It's still going. I can't surf anymore, so that's kind of a bummer. But <laughs> I'm still in the water. I'm halfway there. Don, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been magnificent. Thank you.